So welcome to everyone. Um, I think everyone's in from the waiting room. So welcome to those of you who have not been here before. Um, I do recognize some of those names. So welcome back. Um, we already have a question. How can we access the recording later? That is a great question. Um, so this is recorded. Um, we are the Marine Environmental Education Center located out on Hollywood Beach, Florida. And unfortunately, we are closed. It's a small facility and it's not possible for us to safely open just yet. Um, so we decided to do this webinar series offered every Tuesday and Thursday at 3 p.m. to still engage with the public and still offer some really cool resources for everyone to sort of self-learn from home. Um, so we are recording this. Um, all of our previous sessions are also recorded and they're on our YouTube channel. So if you go to YouTube and look up Meek at the Carpenter House, um, or if you go to any of our social media pages, we are at Seek the Meek um, on all of the social medias, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. We link our YouTube there as well. And you could find the recordings there if you miss part of this or have a previous one that you were really interested in seeing and had a conflict of uh, scheduling, just go check us out there. Um, otherwise, if you still have issues, email us at meek, M-E-E-C, at nova.edu, and we will get you all the information you need. Um, otherwise, today we are lucky enough to be working with Dr. Amy C. Hirons. Um, She is the head of the Charismatic Megafauna and Oceanography Lab at Nova Southeastern University. Um, and today she is going to be giving us a talk about trophic dynamics and all of the work that she does. Um, so we are keeping everyone muted um, just so you can most clearly hear her as she presents. But if you do have any questions, comments, concerns, throw them into that chat. Um, I'll be here the whole time. So if you do have any sort of technical issues, I will try to help from afar. Um, otherwise, I think that's about it for me. Um, so whenever you're ready, feel free to take it away. Well, good afternoon, everyone. As uh, Thank you, Taylor, for the introduction. As Taylor said, my name is Dr. Amy Hirons. I'm an oceanographer here at Nova Southeastern University. Uh, today, I've been asked to give a talk that really falls in line with what we do. As Taylor mentioned, uh, I am the head of the Charismatic Megafauna and Oceanography Laboratory. What that really means is sort of what our title here is, is indicating is that we actually use or, organisms, both plants and animals to really tell us what's going on in the ocean. Our major interest uh, in my lab is about ocean energy and the transfer of that energy. Now we think of energy in the ocean like waves and currents, which is a part of what we do, but we're thinking about, well, how does that physical or abiotic, non-biologic energy transfer and affect organic or biotic organisms? So, and our way of really doing that is through the study of food web dynamics, basically who's eating whom and as well as different types of organic and inorganic contaminants because the major pathway for any kind of contaminant in any water body in this case we're focused mostly on salt water and estuarine coastal waters so contaminants are going to find their way usually via uh, a diet in is ingestion. Another way that we could sort of relabel this talk is how do you use biologics to replace expensive equipment? Because it is very expensive to do the kind of work that we do in the ocean. So while this image is showing you uh, what just one species that we work with, these are stellar sea lions found in Alaska. Uh, we use a variety of organisms, anything from uh, plant material, phytoplankton, seagrasses, kelps, uh, all the way up to the charismatic megafauna that you see here, which can include marine mammals, uh, large apex predators like sharks, uh, oceanic fishes, seabirds, etc. So as I've mentioned, our real pathway of studying, what we do is, is through food webs. And that's what this caricature here is really depicting, is giving us an idea of just who some of the players are. 
as humans, we tend to be organismally oriented, meaning that if I were to ask you, what's your favorite animal? You might actually have one or a group of animals. And that's sort of what this graphic is showing us. It might be, oh, I'm really into octopus or sharks or birds or whales. Uh, some people might even say, hey, I'm into shellfish, shrimp, uh, jellyfish, sponges. I mean, it's, it's the whole spectrum from the microscopic organisms like phytoplankton and zooplankton are um, to, to benthic organisms or, or those organisms that live on or near the bottom, no matter how deep the water is. Those can include things that we think of like coral colonies. So we think of coral as that large exoskeleton with all the little individual uh, polyps or in, uh, the individual corals themselves. They may be organisms that are free swimming in the water column. Uh, fishes are usually a, a good organism to think of. Sometimes even larger zooplankton like copepods and krills to things like turtles and whales and even birds. So when we look and think about marine mammals, we go, wow, they're really big. They're all over the planet. But when we think about them in terms of a food web, they're actually filling a lot of roles here. So let's walk through this image here. If we look on the upper left, that's an image of a bowhead whale. So what you actually see is that very curved mouth and jaw. And they don't have teeth. These are a baleen whale. A baleen is a series of agglutinated or sort of like glued hair together that form these plates. And they line up side by side by side. And this whale can have upwards of 400 plates just on one side of its mouth. And that's sort of what you're seeing here in this part of the image is all of these baleen plates on one side. And what those plates are doing are, while they may be sort of a, a solid plate, one edge of it is fringed. And so it can filter feed and collect all of these microscopic organisms as it swims slowly through the water column with its mouth open. So it's actually feeding on these very microscopic organisms uh, at sort of what we would call the base of the food web. Now, if we move to the upper right, and that's probably an image most people are familiar with, and that's a West Indian manatee. This is a marine mammal that only eats plants. So it's an herbivore. So it also is actually feeding at the very base of a food web in the light zone or what we call the photic zone. Plants are the dominant energy source at the base of a food web. Now, if we look at the lower left, that is a northern sea otter. And while their diet can vary some, the dominant portion of their diet are actually those shelled fish, things like abalone and clams and gooey ducks that you find on the benthos on the bottom or in the sediment. So they're also eating at a different part of the food web than any of the other animals. And then if we look on the lower right, that is a sea lion and they tend to dominantly eat mid-sized to larger fishes sometimes large invertebrates like squid and octopus so by looking at marine mammals as that big group of fissipeds and sirenians and cetaceans and pinnipeds we're actually able to look at a big swath of the food web. And then we could even throw in what we might call the true apex predator. And this is a prime example here for marine mammals, 
many of you probably recognize Orsinus orca, also known as the killer whale. And this animal will eat definite, some groups will eat fish and some groups will eat marine mammals like the one that you see here. So there are distinctions and we can't always lump all of one species together. Another advantage that we have certainly in our lab is that we, our work takes us pole to pole. We'll work in environments from the Arctic to the Antarctic. Uh, these are a couple of my colleagues here uh, when we were in Antarctica uh, on the pancake ice. What's interesting about that, that is the continent of Antarctica you see here in the background. This is the Ross Sea. Uh, the environment you've heard many times is changing and it absolutely is changing. So much so that many times we've been here, this is would have been one solid sheet of ice and not breaking up into these pieces. Now over here, you see in this really dark, that's true open water. What you're starting to see here is that there's actually layering taking place at the ice. It's sort of like um, if your fingernail starts to peel back and it's like you haven't lost your whole fingernail, but it's thinner in spots. That's what's happening here in the waters around Antarctica. And our intended goal, and we're trying to figure out how to safely get that, is this Waddell seal right over here. You can also see there's a little bit right there as well. So our work has definitely changed over the last 20 years. And as the environment is changing, what we're doing. So we know and we've heard repeatedly, the environment's changing. I think those of us, particularly here in South Florida, have come to maybe the realization and pers through personal experience over just the last uh, year or two. We can see that season to season, year to year, our environment is changing. We get many more storms. The storms might be in greater intensities. Uh, there's great variability. So we can't just say that things are warming or things are cooling, but things are definitely changing and it's beyond the norm. So what we're trying to do in our lab is look at some of these changes. So some of the things that we're doing is looking, as I've mentioned, into inorganic and organic contaminants. To give you guys an idea of what does that really mean, when we talk about inorganic contaminants, you might be familiar with the word heavy metals. What that means is it's nothing terribly exotic. It is an element. These are a series of elements that we know of as metals. Lead, tin, zinc, aluminum, and they occur on the periodic table. They are just a chemical element. The reason we call them heavy is that they're a little bit heavier in atomic mass than other elements like hydrogen or helium or nitrogen. So what this image is depicting is some of the sources of these heavy metals in particular. So the obvious ones can include anything related to industrialization, um, byproducts, waste products from manufacturing, uh, petroleum refinery, as well as petroleum use, mining industry, trying to actually extract some of these elements from the crust of our planet. Products that are added to agricultural and horticultural environments. They can be in the form of fertilizers. They can also be portions um, that we think of things like pesticides and herbicides. You can get some heavy metals there, but we can also start to get some organic contaminants. 
So when we think about organic contaminants, you start to see a lot of these letters, PAHs, PCBs, PBDEs, and you go, wow, it's an alphabet soup. What we're really talking about though is, let's think about this in terms, in practical terms. We've heard the terms plastic, microplastics, plastics breaking down into smaller and smaller pieces. That's sort of what this top box is indicating here. What we have are weathering processes, UV radiation from sunlight, certainly wind and water abrasion are helping to break apart these particles. But not only are they breaking them into just smaller versions of their solid self, they're also chemically weathering. And so now their chemical components are breaking apart and starting to dissolve in the water column. And that's what you see in this box on the right. It's just sort of the biochemical composition of what they look like. What are we really talking about though, in terms we can understand? Are they fertilizers? Are they herbicides? Are they um, flame retardants are very common. Are they aromatic hydrocarbons? That's gonna be any form of petroleum products here. Once we've got those chemicals now released into the water column, they can actually adsorb or attach themselves to inorganic material, like the little flotsam you see in the water column, what we might call marine snow, just sort of particulates. It might not be organic at all. It could be inorganic like sediment and uh, non-living pieces of material. So some of these chemicals can attach to that. But these chemicals can also attach and be taken in to organic organisms. And for us, it starts at the base of the food web. And in the photic zone, as I've said, those are plants. And then it gets transferred to, well, what eats the plants? Might be zooplankton eating the phytoplankton. It could be the manatee eating sea grasses and algae. And then what eats the zooplankton? Maybe it's small fish, small invertebrates. What eats them? Larger fish. What eats them? Maybe these apex predators. So now what we've got is this trophic transfer. Trophic literally just means diet. So it's referring to who's eating whom. And so you can get this accumulation effect taking place in both organic and inorganic materials and it accumulates. So a big reason, no pun intended, that we work with these marine mammals is because while they cover a whole spectrum, as I've shown you, from filtering microscopic organisms to eating plants, to eating other fish and marine mammals. They can incorporate the inorganic and organic contaminants at multiple places in the food web. Another thing that we have to take into consideration beyond just what is the current amount of contaminants but also as our environment is changing around the world, particularly noticeable at high alt or latitudes. So I've already shown you one image for what it looks like in Antarctica. This is an image for a coastline. Uh, this is the northern coastline of Alaska. So what you see in that water body there is the Beaufort Sea into the Arctic Ocean. So this is really the edge of the land mass as we get close to the Arctic Ocean, to the North Pole. And what you see, if you look at the, especially this white part existing here in the image, the only living part of this soil or land is just a sort of grayish, greeny brown at the very surface. And that's what we call peat. The rest of this is known as permafrost or permanent frost, frozen ground. Well, as the environment warms, and those of you who've lived in cold environments know that as the seasons change and 
gets warmer, that snow and ice start to break up. And that's what's happening along these coastlines fringing the Arctic Ocean is that this land that may have been frozen for 100,000 years is now breaking apart and falling into the ocean. And what that's contributing is old carbon and contaminants that are naturally occurring on the planet, things like from volcanic eruptions. But they were locked up, frozen on the land. Now it's thawing, thawing even more once it's in the water. And now we even have old materials contributing to our food webs and not just the recent. And we might think of that as having the ultimate impact as killing organisms in the ocean. Particularly, we can go all the way and say, oh, it's killing the marine mammals. It's killing those apex predators. And that can happen. May not be directly. There's a lot of indirect paths through disease, for example, and contaminants can be considered that. But one thing we're trying to do is not get to this point. So let's talk about some of the organisms that we've worked with, uh, with not just our lab, but also collaborating with other labs at universities, state and federal agencies. So this is some of our tagging data that we work together to collect. And there are many organisms listed here on the right, including large pelagic fishes, marine mammals, seabirds, there are reptiles. So if you want, it's a big colored conglomeration. And this is just information we have for the Pacific Ocean predominantly. And you can see on the very bottom along that X axis, that some of the colors can be defined. So you go, oh, okay, those green dots that are crossing the Pacific Ocean are actually leatherback turtles. Or that sort of dark navy blue color is actually gray whales and so on. So what this is allowing us to do is overlap tracking data from different types of tags to get an idea of just how these animals are moving. Not all animals are migratory, many are, and certainly that was the focus of this study and this uh, grouping of organisms. So I said, it's great to work with marine mammals because they eat throughout the food web, depending on what species you're looking at. It's great to work with marine mammals because there are many, many species that are migrators or travel great distances. So they're covering a lot of territory for us. If we were to try and go to sea uh, on a ship, it would cost us eighty dollars to $100,000 a day. And we could just cover a tiny little speck of the ocean in a day where we can let these natural data loggers do what they do, travel throughout the oceans. So not only are they collecting data through time, they're collecting data over great spaces and distances. So one of the animals we work with, in particular, one of the tissues we work with, this is a northern fur seal. And what you really sticks out in this image are their whiskers, also known as vibrissae. What they are, are like really stout hairs, but they grow much like the hair on our heads. They grow from a follicle or the root and grow outward. And then once they grow, the tissue that comprises that whisker or a hair, it doesn't change. Remember that expression I said, you are what you eat? Well, every one of the cells in our bodies is comprised of whatever was part of our diet, including the nutrients and the contaminants. So when those whiskers grow, they're locking in information that doesn't change. It's not like uh, taking a blood sample one day and then 30 days later expecting to see the same thing. 
Okay, because the blood cells are turning over. Where once our hair is grown, it's not turning over. So when we use one technique called stabilized isotope analysis, and we go ahead and cut up that whisker into small little uh, same size increments, we can actually plot this so that if you look on the x axis, the length of that whisker from the base or the root of it all the way out is recording information about both the base of the food web, its carbon source, which is in the blue, as well as what trophic level it's been foraging at, and that's sort of in the purplish color. So when I say trophic level, using this technique doesn't tell us, oh, this fur seal was eating 65% of its diet was herring. Doesn't work in that specificness. But what it's saying is, well, in the trophic level in which herring reside, there are also capelin and sand lands, and they may or may not have a similar carbon value. The thing that's probably the most striking to you as you look at this data is you go, gee, it oscillates. It goes up and down and up and down and up and down regularly. And what we've been able to determine is that each one of these cycles is one year. And certain sea lions and fur seals in particular, we can get anywhere from seven or eight years worth of information of not only what the animal's eating, but where it's been and what kind of changes might have occurred during that time. So when we look at this animal, we go, well, gee, it looks like it's, you know, pretty stable, pretty much doing the same thing. But what we notice when we start to doing these analyses is that there have been some changes in the slope in both carbon and nitrogen. Now alone we go, well, that's just one animal. It's just off doing its thing. But that's why we go ahead and look at dozens, if not hundreds of animals occupying space and time. So you think back to that figure I showed you of all that tracking data for all these different species. Now you understand why we have so many animals to make sure it's not a seal just going to the beat of its own drum as the same. So another tissue that we use here are gonna be teeth. Now, these represent two different species. On the left, you can see with a very um, specific trainer is the head of a stellar sea lion. And so you can see proportionally the size of its mouth and its teeth relative to particularly the hands, let alone the head of this trainer while on the left is a harbor seal, also has teeth, both have whiskers. Well, we can use whiskers and get, as I said, a, uh, a certain amount of time, maybe several years information. On a harbor seal, we usually only get about one year for the whiskers, but these are great tissues to work with when you have living animals, because you can get these tissues generally without harming the animal whatsoever. But at times when we have dead animals, um, whether it's through native hunters or they've just died in the field and we've been able to collect their teeth, we're actually able to work with a whole tooth. And these are the canine teeth. What I wanna point out here is if I go back and show you this image, and you see this part of the canine tooth and the stellar sea lion. And this part of the tooth here in the harbor seal's mouth, those are the canine teeth. This part here that I'm drawing around, the tip of the tooth, that's what's exposed, what you see in the image. The rest of this is root and embedded in the jaw of the animal. So you can see we're not gonna just easily be able to pull a tooth from any one of these animals. But what we can do with teeth is usually get 
information about the whole life of the animal. So what you see here is a cross section, a longitudinal cross section through a tooth. And if you look on the right side where all the numbers are, it starts in with its birth year with the number one. And it goes on, this animal was 13 years old when it died and we were able to extract the tooth. And if you look carefully, you can see there's sort of these alternating light and dark bands here. That's how we represent and can determine one year to the next. So we usually know what year an animal has died and we can work our way back and go, oh, well, if this animal died here in 2006, and this was 2005, 2004, 2003, and so on. And then we can grind out portions of these teeth to do our chemical analyses to get an idea of what was its diet like? What was its contaminant load early in its life versus later in its life? Another example of a type of tooth is in a narwhal. You might have heard of a narwhal or even seen images of one. What you see here is that the males have a modified incisor, which are the teeth we just looked at. And they grow into this for basically sexual selections. It's to tell the females, hey, look at my tusk. I have great prowess here. I have great traits. And this is what a series of the tusks look like. So you can see they sort of grow in a very distinctive spiral pattern. And what we can do with tusks is similar to what we do with the teeth in the seals and the sea lions, is that we can cut them longitudinally down the length and look at these individual layers to give us an indication. So one of those first images I showed was of a bowhead whale. And this is an aerial view of a bowhead whale. Now, interesting thing, and I don't want anybody to be upset, but people have eaten marine mammals for centuries, for millennia. And much like you might not give a second thought to going and eating a hamburger or cooking ribs or maybe even a turkey this week. These people, what we call indigenous peoples or native peoples, various places around the world, haven't had access to other organisms or other plants and animals except in the ocean. So these are uh, Inuits from the northern reaches of North America. And they are federally allowed to hunt a certain number of animals to feed themselves and their entire villages throughout the year. What I want to point out here is, you see here on the right, this series, those are the baleen plates that I showed you in the mouth of that whale early on. So you can start to see this fringe here. And that's what allows the little microscopic organisms to collect in the baleen plates. And then they have a massive tongue that much like we take our tongue and wipe the back of our teeth, they take their tongue to wipe the back of those baleen plates, be able to swallow the organisms that were collected there and start all over again. But it's when, and, and working collectively, with these indigenous groups, we're able to get tissues from these animals that we would never be able to get on our own because we don't go out and kill marine mammals. We haven't for nearly 50 years. So initially, tissues that were very commonly gotten were pieces of blubber and skin. And that's what you see here is that this top layer here, this dark black, is the very thick skin of the whale. And all of this white down to this point is all blubber, so it's lipid. The purpose of blubber or lipid is energy. You store energy in fat and it gets mobilized. Well, the nice thing when you're studying contaminants is that 
contaminants like to bind or adhere to the lipid but it can also be released quickly if the lipids used up. So we want to look at something that has a longer timeline and that's where these baleen plates come into play. Baleen plates are the same material as our hair, whiskers, fingernails, claws, it's all keratin. And it works the same way. Once that baleen grows out of the jaw, it doesn't change. So it's recording many years over the life of the animal of where it's been, what it's been eating. So if we take a moment and just look at this picture, this is from a baleen plate. And the x-axis here is representing the time period. Remember I said that where it's growing from, the root is gonna be the most recent growth. And then we move back through time. So this animal died in uh, 1987. And that's when we started analyzing the baleen. And you can see it goes back through time to the winter of 1979. And what is represents, for example, is cadmium and cobalt, chromium, copper, iron, mercury, zinc, selenium, lead, nickel, and manganese. Well, mercury, you've probably heard, oh, mercury is bad for us. Well, mercury is not good. But there's also that expression, too much of a good thing. Some of these things we need, we have to have in our body. But you can have too much and it still not be good for you. And these whales don't necessarily have a way to excrete or get rid of the extra. It's like if we have too much vitamin C, our bodies can get rid of that extra through urine and it doesn't hurt us. But other things can accumulate in the tissues. And what we can see here, and what's really interesting is that we see very distinct changes in some of these levels or concentrations of these metals through time. So we're trying to time it to, is it the season, summer versus winter? It's a migrating animal, so it goes into different water bodies or varying year to year. Now, something else we can get from animals like the whales, uh, whether they're toothed whales or baleen whales, in that right hand image, that's what we call an earplug. It's basically ear wax. And in cetaceans, they lay, they put down earwax and it accumulates in layers throughout their entire life. Can't imagine that happening to us. We're not equipped for that. But if you look carefully, you see these multiple layers. So we're working with colleagues of ours in Texas to actually look at hormone concentrations as well as food web information and contaminant information in the earwax. Fortunately for us, we have many institutions around the world that collect particularly hard parts, parts of these marine mammals that preserve. What you see here is a colleague of mine who's the assistant curator of marine mammals at the National Museum of Natural History at the Smithsonian Institution. And Charlie is standing next to a blue whale skull. Well, they don't just have one. They actually have hundreds of skulls and vertebrae from all kinds of animals. What you see here on the floor between John and Rachel and Charlie and Jim is a blue whale skeleton laid out here on the warehouse floor. We also see a series of blue whale skulls and vertical. On the shelves, you can actually see the vertebrae that comprise the spine of these whales. So you can see storing these tissues is not uh, an easy topic. And it takes a great commitment financially and otherwise. So what I wanna show you is, well, what can we get from bone? So. For example, I've been talking about the stable isotopes, getting an idea of diet. 
We can also do things like radiocarbon dating. You've probably heard of carbon-14 dating so that we can work with not just modern animals, but also archeologic animals as well. We can take organic components of bone like the collagen and actually look at other elements, whether they're radioactive, whether they are um, contaminants, whether they're telling us information about the oceans, et cetera. So we're getting a lot of ecosystem information that goes back through time. And depending on where they are in the world, there have been a variety of changes. So this picture, for example, is showing a time series for the fisheries in the Gulf of Alaska. The Gulf of Alaska is one of the largest fisheries on the planet. And in the 1960s, as the top image shows, this system was dominated by these royal red shrimp. I mean, that was the fishery to be had. And you can see there's very little small fishes and it's all shrimp. During the 1970s, I started to see this transition to these larger non-fatty type fish, what we call gaddits, started to show up when they were also trawling for shrimp. And then by the 1980s, there were just no shrimp to be had anywhere. And it's dominated now by gaddits and still to this day, it's heavily dominated by these non-fatty fish. So what causes that? There are, are a series of patterns that occur on the planet. And one is changes in sea surface temperature. That's what this SST stands for. And there are all kinds of patterns that exist and, and naturally exist. And this one I'm just showing is the PDO, or the Pacific Interdecadal Oscillation. There's the North Atlantic Oscillation, there's the Southern Ocean Oscillation. And what this bottom plot is showing you is that there are changes or anomalies that have taken place in ocean temperature through time. And this is just showing the most recent century. What this image is showing is that you can collect data and overlap it. So for example, I've got information from baleen whales. So those baleen plates I showed you. This bright pink is actually sediment. These purple or blue diamonds are sea lion whiskers. The turquoise is atmospheric CO2 levels. The brown dots, tree ring data. Overlay that with those purple Xs and that's sea surface temperature. They've all been adjusted so that we could overlay them together and go, can we see patterns in one organism? Do we see it in other organisms in the ocean? Do, we, do those patterns match what's happening in the atmosphere or what's being recorded in trees growing on land? So it, is a, it can be a very powerful uh, ability to look at different materials, organic and inorganic. I mentioned uh, paleoarchaeologic bones, for example, and that's what this image is representing. These are all, each dot is a bone from a stellar sea lion. And it covers nearly the last 7,000 years. Using the same technique, looking at trophic level for carbon and nitrogen. The takeaway from this is there are regular up and down oscillating patterns that took place long before human influence here in the last 200 years with industrial revolution, where we started artificially putting CO2 and other gases into the atmosphere. So there are a lot of natural cycles that are taking place on the planet that we also have to tease out. This is the same example again of this oscillating pattern taking place over the last 6,000 years and this is in sediment. 
but this is coastal sediment that collect salmon scales, like when salmon come in to spawn. So again, we're laying many different uh, data sets. Oh, here's sediment. Oh, here are tree rings. Oh, here are the marine mammals. And I guess I want to remind people that there are groups of people around the planet who don't eat the same things that we do, who are reliant directly on the organisms we happen to be studying for survival. So there may be a direct impact to certain groups of people by eating these animals and any contaminants that they have, much like we'd be concerned if our spinach has E. coli or not. But we also can use these animals as sentinels, sort of that canary in the mine shaft to let us know what's going on in water bodies around the world. And with that, I'll stop here and see. And uh, if you have any questions, feel free to include them in the chat. I'm sure Taylor will be able to pull them up for us. And if you have any further questions or interest in what our lab does here at Nova Southeastern University, feel free to email me at hirons at nova.edu or check out our websites either through the university or at Weebly. Thank you. Very cool. Thank you so much. Um, we do have some questions in the chat. If you want, I could read them off to you. Um, I don't well, know if you could ask. Let's take a quick look, see what yeah. we've got here. Uh, okay, so here's one. Do you know similar studies on dentition of organisms that frequently lose teeth or the results not as significant? There has been work done on that, but as you pointed out in your question, organisms like elasmobranchs that tend to lose their teeth, or even marine mammals, uh, such as our sirenians, like dugongs and manatees, can also lose their teeth. You just have to know what that time period is. It's like anything. For example, we use our whiskers here. We have to know how quickly do those whiskers grow? Do they replace their whiskers? For example, I mentioned on fur seals versus a harbor seal. And I said, fur seals and sea lions, we can get many years worth of information, but harbor seals or even sea otters, we might only get one year of information. It's because those animals tend to molt their whiskers when they're replacing their fur, where sea lions and fur seals don't. So knowing how quickly your tissue grows or gets replaced is, is critical but you can absolutely do very similar uh, growth kinds of studies and contaminant or trophic studies with teeth of other organisms. Uh, from Elliot, it says in a previous Meek lecture, the speaker said that fertilizer runoff has contributed to making part of the St. John River unnavigable due to overgrown flora. So once the St. John River, which flows into the Atlantic Ocean, does the higher salinity make a problem better or worse? In other words, are organic contaminants primarily an inland waterway problem or does it affect oceans as well? Uh, the short answer is organic contaminants, no matter what it is, is going to have ramifications or effects everywhere. Uh, fresh water, salt water, atmosphere terrestrially, it may not be the exact same problem. So for example, getting uh, relating back to the previous lecture, saying that whatever the, the fertilizer runoff, for example, has led to you put fertilizer on land to get your plants to grow, particularly in agricultural locations but that excess fertilizer not, or nutrients, if you will, not taken up by the terrestrial plants has now been washed off into the waterways. So that is now creating an overgrowth of aquatic plants. And yes, that can also happen and does happen out in salt water. Now, the same thing can happen if we have what we might go an associated contaminant 
So what we're actually doing is looking at concentrations of levels of these different kinds of contaminants, organic, inorganic, and trying to follow how do their concentrations change? Do they change through time? Um, and again, it, it's not an easy task. And one of the first images I showed was that image showing of all these different um, migration patterns and movement patterns. It would be great to say, oh, wow, you have this level that corresponds with the Gulf of California during March of this particular year. We're working our way there, but there's a lot of data to be gathered. So we tend to look at parcels of water, some kind of water body. Usually it might be a location. We have, uh, for example, we have study sites in the Northwest Hawaiian Islands. We work in Peru a lot. So now we can focus on the animals that occupy these water bodies. And we like to work with animals that will stay in a location as well as those that will travel. Uh, as far as what medium is best used, when you're working with certain organisms, you go, what's the likelihood I'm going to get an earplug from a whale? Well, if I'm getting an earplug, which might have information over the whole life, that animal has to be dead and it has to have been collected. And I can get stabilized topes and my colleagues can get hormones and we can get contaminants out of that. And they do exist. There are museums around the world that have jars full of those earplugs that I showed represented on a hand. Um, do we still get them? Yes. But is it really common? Well, it's not like, uh, you know, picking corn common. Um, so we go, well, what can we get? That's why we don't just focus on one tissue because there may be times, for example, we're doing a contaminant study with Humboldt penguins and we're starting with a captive study because we want to know in a known diet with a spiked a certain amount, of very low concentration of different metals or different organic contaminants, how does that get expressed for our interest in eggshells, because we're looking to see, do certain animals have a mechanism to offload, get rid of contaminants or certain concentrations of contaminants that might be harmful to their body? Well, we can look at different components that make up the fetus or what would make up a chick. And we can also look at the components that wouldn't hurt that chick at all. Let's put it in the shell. So it's, it, there's a lot of avenues. And if we start and think about it, we, we can use a, most any kind of material. Uh, let's see, do you have advice for aspiring marine science to get involved in marine mammalogy and trophic studies? Uh, depending on where you are in your life career, certainly we use a lot of math and science, as you might imagine. It is how we do our work. Uh, we do a lot of analyses. Taylor, for one, could tell you that. Uh, we do chemical analyses. We do statistical analyses. We do a lot of modeling, which uses math. We have... Um, I'd say read, read a lot. I read a lot. Uh, read about things you never thought you'd be interested in. So open your mind just by listening to me today, whether it's my video or listening to me live or anyone else, you might have had your perspective change and open your mind to different thoughts. Um, get any kind of experience you can. Uh, I was born on the mainland, but I grew up in Hawaii. And you go, oh, you were in the ocean. Yeah, but it, just because you're living along an ocean, uh, on an island, 
doesn't guarantee that you're going to get into marine science, even if you want to. You've got to sort of search out who's out there. And one way is would be like doing what I'm doing and going, hey, you know that Dr. Hiron, she might have some information. I might just email her. I'm sure all of the panelists that you've had yeah, with me have been open to those kinds of contacts. Oh, absolutely. It is so vitally important to network to reach out and ask questions. Um, so I appreciate you sharing your email with everyone. Um, I think that was the last of the questions. Um, and I know you do have another meeting. So I just wanted to say thank you all for coming today. Um, if you have questions that you think of later, um, you have Dr. Hiram's email right there. If you don't write it down, can't remember it, you can email us at meek, M-E-E-C, at nova.edu, and we'll forward it right along. Um, otherwise, we don't have our December schedule out just yet. We are taking the rest of November off for the holidays. Um, so keep an eye on all of our social medias, um, at Seek the Meek on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. We will be posting our December schedule soon. Um, and if you missed any of this, it is recorded. We are putting it onto our YouTube channel as soon as we do a quick edit to get all of our chatting at the beginning out and add some more information. Um, otherwise, thank you very much for the awesome, awesome presentation. Um, it was fantastic uh, and I really appreciate it. So thank you guys. Have a good Thanksgiving, have a good holiday and stay safe, okay?